Okay, let me give a quick intro to everybody. Um, so it gives me really great pleasure to um, introduce Professor Sun as our speaker. I mean, Professor Sun has a distinguished academic career. Um, she is Chancellor Professor and Maynard Chair uh, of Mechanical Engineering. Um, she was a physics faculty at Princeton for 10 years before coming to Berkeley. And um, he, um, she came to Berkeley and started bioengineering. <laughs> so it's quite different. Um, Professor Sun is a core member of the UCSF, UC Berkeley Joint Graduate Group in bioengineering. She has received numerous awards. Uh, it's not too long to list, but uh, yeah. some, not <laughs> some notable ones, uh, uh, Cat Foundation Award and Baker Fellow Award. Um, she's a fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering and a member of the American Society of Cell Biology. So she has built SOLAB, an impressive bioengineering research facility, and have received extensive funding for that. Um, I, I count her, we count her as a great supporter of H2H8. Uh, she, has the, she has mentored the largest number of explorers. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes, so she is wow. uh, number one in our, in our um, a uh, number of explorers, I think. Uh, so, um, so it gives me, you know, great pleasure to welcome Professor Sun for for giving her talk. So, uh, let's welcome her. Oh, thank you so much, and thank you very much for such a such a wonderful introduction. And I really want to thank all of you and H two H eight for you know, supporting my, my, my students, it, it takes a, it takes a village to mentor um, students. So I really appreciate the strong support you have given all of my students. Um, so I kind of uh, prepare sort of us how I actually ended up here at Berkeley and who my mentors were. And I thought I sort of just give a little bit of a background of who I am and, and so forth and sort of really how I entered into the, into engineering and so forth. Um, so let me see. So I haven't done this previously. I don't know if you can see this or is this? Uh... Yes. Okay, so who am I? Um, I so a little known fact um, is that I am actually a direct descendant of Yi Sun Shin, who was an uh, admiral in the Korean Navy in the 1500s. <laughs> and he is very famous for being one of the um, Korean Navy or just Navy Admiral tacticians. And he did create something called the Turtle Ship, which was the world's first ironclad ship. And you can oh. see pictures of this in the in the Korean museums. And I've actually had a chance to visit that. Um, the, his statue, many of his statues and um, a lot of the different um, artifacts that are in the Korean National Museum. And it's really cool. It's all from my mom's side of the family. And I thought it was really interesting that he was known for constantly, um, Korea was always being invaded by the Japanese and also the Chinese. But during his time, it was mostly the Japanese. And he's very famous for this one battle where he only had 13 of these um, turtle ships, but he was fighting um, a Japanese Navy of over 300 ships. Oh and he defeated, <laughs> he, he won that battle. So it's really cool that I'm a descendant of, of this uh, admiral. So it's, it's quite our family pride in that regard. <laughs> um, yeah, and if you got, got a chance to talk to my mom and dad, they would just go on and on. I'm only giving you a two minute introduction. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think what's really also just sort of like who my entire family is, and it really kind of gives you a sense of, you know, really how I ended up in the sciences. Um, I'm actually what I would call a second generation professor academic. My father was an EECS professor at Stevens Institute of Technology in New Jersey and also at NJIT. Um, he famously retired at age 81 
and then went back to work and taught for another four years, um, six months later. So he he really enjoys um, teaching um, engineering students. Um, my mom was one of the first female dentists in Korea. Um, and she actually came to the U.S. in 1961 on a Guggenheim Fellowship. And that's where she met my dad. So we have a lot to thank of the Guggenheim Fellowship. <laughs> committee for selecting her and you know she's quite the trailblazer and you know it wasn't easy to be a, uh, in STEM at that time in Korea. Um, my sister is um, sort of follows my mom's path and she was in biology she's a medical doctor and then a PhD um, she was a cardiology fellow at Harvard Medical School but now she works at a biotech company in the South Bay and then my husband, Ed Hester, works in the Marvell Nanolab. So it's kind of like we do have this um, strong connection to UC Berkeley. Here you see my my twins. This was a few years ago. Now they're way taller than me. So, mm -hmm. you know, but, um, you know, my family is very much um, science and engineering. And as I mentioned, I am a second generation academic. So it's kind of like sort of how it how did my research journey, um, how did I get here? And I'll just sort of give you this brief overview and please um, please feel free to ask questions. So um, I grew up in New Jersey. Um, I was actually born in New York City, almost in the Holland Tunnel. Um, so that was always another fun fact about me, um, but I did make it onto the other side into Manhattan to get um, for my birth. Um, <laughs> From a very young age, and I would say it probably was in the DNA, in my DNA, um, given my parents' background, that I always loved science. I always loved exploring um, in the backyard of our house in New Jersey. I loved mixing chemicals. I remember, still remember my dad bringing home like different chemicals from the chemistry department at his school. And I would mix things up and there was always a danger that I was going to blow something up. I, I you know, I really appreciate that my parents gave me that freedom. My dad let me use a blowtorch when I was five years old to light up a whole bunch of magnesium on the on the driveway. So, I mean, <laughs> I really had a lot of freedom um, to just explore and do things. Um, from And I would say probably starting in sixth or seventh grade, I started to really get um, serious and starting to do sort of project-oriented experiments. And so I entered into a lot of um, science fairs um, and got to travel a bit and, um, you know, win a couple competitions, um, science fairs. And then from there, um, I went to Harvard um, as an undergraduate. I actually was a chemistry major at the time, but then I got pretty scared of all the chemistry um, students because they were very, very competitive. And I just, it was, it was scary for me. So I ended up um, realizing that in my physics classes, we were all scared together and we were all lost together. <laughs> so as a result, it was a community. And I would say that I pretty much entered into physics because of my friends versus actually the subject area, which was interesting, but it was really just this whole community that we were there to support each other. You know, late nights, everyone's sitting around a big table trying to figure out what was the problem set about. <laughs> um, and then from there, um, I graduated and then I ended up staying at Harvard for my graduate degree. And there I crossed over to the, across the street and went into the physics department. Um, I actually did um, superconductivity, which I have a few slides, um, a slide about that. But I was basically making um, radar devices out of superconducting materials, superconducting devices. Um, and so I was at, in, at Harvard for a total of eight years, both as an undergraduate and graduate. And then from there, I did a postdoc that, in the Netherlands at um, TU Delft or Technical University of Delft, which is their version of MIT. It's considered the MIT of the Netherlands. Um, and that's where I went from like to the macroscopic uh, or micron scale down to the nano scale. Um, I was doing a lot of things they're learning about e-beam lithography, making very small structures. And then from there, um, I ended up going back to New Jersey. At that time, if you wanted to go into academia and you, you would have to do, you actually would 
you were kind of expected, but it wasn't required, but you were just expected that you would do a postdoc in Europe, and then you would come back to the US and reintroduce yourself to the community, and you would do a second postdoc. And so I was there at at t Bell Laboratories, um, the main la um, labs at Bell in Murray Hill, New Jersey. I was there for about a year and a half. Um, and then from there, I was a professor of physics at Princeton, um, quite challenging there. I would say it was the first time I was ever made aware that I was a woman in the sciences. And so that was quite shocking. And you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So from Princeton, um, from that point, I then went to um, went to Berkeley um, and I was in the mechanical engineering department and I've been in the mechanical engineering department. I'm not sure if, you, if this thing is in the way for people to see. Um, so I've been at Berkeley for um, 20 years now. I missed my 20th anniversary um, luncheon. So that was sort of unfortunate, <laughs> but um, it's been a great ride here at, at Berkeley. Um, so that's kind of my research journey. and. Um, I really have switched fields in many ways. Whether it was the right thing to do, I'm not quite sure career-wise, but um, scientifically and for for my satisfaction and enjoyment, I definitely think it was the right thing to do. Um, so throughout this research journey, I've had several several mentors who have just been an amazing presence in my career and in my life. So my very first mentor was Cindy Friend. She was the first um, female um, professor in the sciences at Harvard who, who got tenure. Um, she was my undergraduate advisor. And she's also very interesting because she had a choice to either go to grad school or to join the LPGA. She's that good at golf. Um, <laughs> And at the time, if people are, are circa my age, they would know Nancy Lopez. She could beat Nancy Lopez with no problem. So it was uh, it was very interesting that, it, and if you could ever invite her to hear her story, it's really an amazing story of how she ended up choosing chemistry. Um, um, she's She left Harvard recently and she now runs the Cavalier Institute, um, Nano Institute or the foundation down in Los Angeles, amazing woman. Um, my advisor, um, PhD advisor was Mike Tinkham in the physics department at Harvard. Um, I have what he has. I was student number forty three, um, and he's had he had about seventy students altogether, and every one of his students had a moniker, and mine was I was his first last student because he said that after me he wasn't going to take on any other students. But um, he ended up taking like 20 more after me. So it was pretty, it was amazing his, uh, how much he was able, he has done. Um, he actually got his start at Berkeley in the physics department. And so it was quite interesting, his career path as, as well. And unfortunately, he um, passed away about um, 10 years ago. Another person who's been a very strong mentor is Elaine Oran. Um, she used to be at NRL, Navy, Naval Research Laboratory. She's a computational um, fluid dynamics person. And I had done a little bit of, of, of a summer internship with her right before grad school. And I've always enjoyed her take on different things um, and what she's had to do to, to get where she is. And then finally, another mentor is George Whitesides in chemistry um, at Harvard. And um, I'll have a fun story about him in pretty much in the next slide. But all of these people have really given me the strength to continue on because I think in academia, you kind of have to really love it. Like, you know, like you're playing the piano or the violin, you're doing it for yourself. So Cindy was the one who told me, you know, always aim high because no matter where you end up, it'll always be better than if you didn't aim high at all, which is clearly true. Um, Mike Tankum told us, told everyone when we graduated, when we defended our thesis, that you had a choice, we all had choices. And the choice was either to be a path follower or a path maker. And so a lot of his students, including myself, we tried to choose that path maker route and everything like that. Elaine is just always just like saying, we have to fight, fight for women um, in the sciences. And I just think, you know, she's just, was just, she's done an amazing job. And then um, George Whitesides is just George. So he's just an inspiring person that I've just really always enjoyed talking with him. 
um, and, and talking about research and so forth. So these are very strong mentors and I really have to say I, I owe a lot to them for where I am right now. Um, so sort of shifting gears about what I did, have done and what I'm doing now. Um, as in my PhD and in my postdoctoral work, I was working with superconducting devices. Um, they were called Josephson Junction Arrays and they respond to RF microwaves. And as I mentioned before, they're used for, um, um, for microwave antennas. Um, there's one that's these long wires here, but they're actually, that's actually a whole bunch of squids in, in parallel and that's used right now. This particular device is used for geochemistry type of work. And then when I was a postdoc at Delft, I was working on something called the Aronoff um, Kescher effect. And it was basically something equivalent to looking at quantum mechanics plus um, classical mechanics. So pretty neat stuff, um, all working at low temperature from 40 degrees Kelvin all the way to 100 millikelvin. So you can, what I now do is everything at room temperature. Um, and I will say that it's a lot easier to do things at low temperature because if something doesn't work, you can just turn it off and come back the next day. In biology, that's clearly not the case. You have to just keep on going. Um, so how I met um, George Whitesides was essentially, I was making these different structures. They're made out of niobium and copper. And um, when I, I bumped into George Whitesides at a talk and he was showing this figure right here, which is his method of doing replication of stamping something off of a what they call a negative master to make a PDMS structure, a rubber structure or something. Um, and I was looking at his beautiful picture that he was showing in his talk and I realized, oh my gosh, that's my device, that's my mask that I was using as a graduate student. Cause there was some there was actually um something in that that I put accidentally made a mistake on that mask. And so I just went, oh I interrupted his talk by going, oh, I know that's from my mask. And he just looked at me and the whole audience froze and just was like, I can't believe you just stopped George Whitesides. And so I was so embarrassed and I went up to him afterwards to explain why I, I, I was just surprised. And after that, we became really good friends. So it's just a kind of an interesting story. Um, story. And I would say that his devices look so much better than mine, <laughs> even though they came from the same mask and everything. <laughs> um, so really, in the end, um, just sort of what I do, um, my lab is very interdisciplinary and really pretty much take lots of the technologies that I developed um, as a graduate student and as a postdoc and use it now um, towards um, looking at biological systems. So one of the things that we've done um, is something called high throughput DNA patterning, whereby what we can do is we can put cells and proteins on a substrate surface in, very, in a space, spatially, we can pattern. And the way we do this is we can, we take advantage of the fact that DNA, single strands of DNA will hybridize to their complementary strands. And the fact that DNA strands can um, attach or conjugate to a glass slide. And essentially we use the photolithography that I've always used to make my just injunctions to make resist templates whereby we can essentially pattern different um, DNA sequences on a substrate, take their complementary strands, tag them to cells or to proteins, and then wash everything on the surface. And you can see here, just this is an example in this sort of slow, um, small um, picture, but these are actually cells. And essentially they're cells of different that have been tagged with different sequences of DNA. And we pattern those different, the complementary sequences on the glass slide. And we're just showing how well we're able to pattern cells. Um, this is just a cool picture because what it represents is that each one of these little squares, this is an expanded view, but each one of these squares is sort of a culture condition that we can examine and look at how cells respond. And so you can think of this in the traditional biology sense that each one of these squares actually corresponds to a Petri dish. But with the technology that we're using, lithography, 
traditional um, photolithography, we can put down thousands of these Petri dishes onto a single glass slide and do measurements all simultaneously. So it's a pretty neat technology. And this is just an example where we've looked at stem cells and how they respond and what do they like to respond to in terms of different proteins. Um, another thing that we're doing, which I'll talk a little bit more in depth, is the fact that we're um, investigating um, different microenvironments that correspond to um, breast tissue and really trying to understand um, sort of how these how different cell types within the breast tissue respond to um, proteins and 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 so forth. Um, yeah, at different ages, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. Um, let's see. Another thing that we do is we do um, cell mechanophenotyping, where we're looking. We have a particular device that we call node pore sensing, but what that allows us to do is again takes we do a measurement that's similar to what I would be doing with superconducting wires and measuring current. And what we're able to do is um, sort of measure biophysical features of cells just by looking at current traces as cells pass through microflow channel. And what we're able to do is um, tell if cells come from a young or from an old woman, and also whether or not a cell is resistant or not resistant to a particular drug. So it's it's... It's a really new field overall, looking at biophysical properties of cells within the context of different cancers. Um, but it's really interesting and it's, it's a lot of exploring and, and quite fun. Mm -hmm. um, another project that we're doing is um, developing liquid biopsies um, in terms of being able to monitor different cancers. And in this particular case, for us, we're focusing on lung cancer. Um, and for us, we wanted to be able to do measurements by essentially looking for something called a tumor-derived exosome. So an exosome is essentially these small particles that cells will blub off, and they really are these packets of information that cells use to communicate to other cells. Um, tumor cells produce a lot of these um, uh, packets of information, these exosomes, and we're trying to capture them and identify them and really look to see how the tumor changes as a patient undergoes treatment. And it's a liquid biopsy because we're just looking at blood plasma um, or saliva versus actually doing an invasive, um, invasive biopsy which obviously is expensive, causes um, a lot of pain and so forth. In this case, it's just a, draw, a withdrawal of blood. Um, and then finally, I think many of you know, Stephanie, we're working also on brain organoids and looking at, you know, can we recapitulate and understand um, neurodegenerative um, disorders um, by essentially having them inside a brain organoid. So you can see we're doing a lots of different things, very interdisciplinary, which I really enjoy. Um, I think that's where you can make the biggest impact in the field. And um, yeah, it's 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 really cool stuff that we're doing in the lab. Um, so just highlighting one specific project, because I do want to leave time for questions and everything. Um, so a big focus is breast cancer. And this is work that I'm doing with um, a really good collaborator um, and one of my best friends, Mark Labarge, who's at the City of Hope. He used to be at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. And I should say that this collaboration um, was born 10 years ago, um, but it really spent probably the first four or five years trying to figure out how we could collaborate, you know, what's the best project and so forth. So in terms of breast cancer, um, it's really, it's, now the most commonly diagnosed cancer worldwide, one in eight women will develop breast cancer in her lifetime. So about 12%, that's the sort of the uh, predictability. Um, the thing about breast cancer is that a woman has that one in, eight, one in eight chance of developing breast cancer. But if you actually look at an aging curve and breast cancer incidence, what you find is that it's not constant one in eight chance throughout a woman's lifetime. Rather, it actually increases. So that somewhere about between, I would say starting at 60 to 80 years old, that's when the chance of developing breast cancer in a woman greatly increases. Um, 
And so it's it's really, it's quite interesting. And as a result, what people will say is that because of this curve that really shifted towards older women, people will say that breast cancer is a disease of the aging. Um, certainly there are factors that can complicate things. So a woman, again, has that one in eight chance, much higher, it goes up to 20, 30% as she gets older, add on to another 25% increase in risk by, if, by in terms of weight gain, um, um, drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes, you increase um, your risk factor considerably. Now, um, having said that, the biggest risk factor um, for breast cancer is whether or not you harbor a mutation, one of the known mutations, BRCA1 to PALB2 mutations, um, and whether or not your family history has already a strong history of breast cancer. In those cases, a young woman, say someone who's 19 years old, her risk of breast cancer increases to all the way up to 80%. So that's really, again, remarkable. So, you know, a young woman, 19 years old, one in eight chance versus an older woman would have something like 50 to 60% chance. But a young woman who has one of these genetic mutations all the way increases up to 80%. So, you know, what are there, what methods are there for early surveillance? Um, right now, there's genetic screening and women who have harbor these mutations, they um, have a, um, a option to do a mastectomy, so basically do something prophylactic. But at the end of the day, you know, despite how many how much advances have been occurring with um, breast cancer, it's the fact that even though we know women's um, breast cancer risk increases with these mutations, we really still don't know who's going to develop breast cancer, right? Someone who has this mutation um, has this as equal chance as someone else who has a mutation, but those two might still might not develop breast cancer, right? Um, and also right now there's no genetic assay for women who have a strong history of breast cancer in their family, but they don't harbor any of these mutations. There's no molecular um, screening that's available right now. And so with that, um, Mark and I set off to sort of, it really, we have a nice story, but it really started with, let's just stick some of Mark's cells into our device. And so this is the device. You can see it's it's quite simple in many ways. And what it is, is we're measuring cells as they pass through what we call the node pore sensor. And it has a contraction segment where cells would have to squeeze through to pass through. And what we do is we do, we measure the current through a four terminal measurement. And the main thing to know is that a microfluid channel, once it's filled up with fluid, it acts like a wire. It has a certain amount of current. And then as a cell passes through, it's an insulator. So it's changing the amount of conducting fluid that's in any particular part of the device, any part of the channel. So essentially you're um, blocking current. And so you see decreases in current. And then when it goes through this contraction channel where it has to really squeeze, you see a huge drop off in current because that's that channel, that part of the wire of the wire essentially is really being blocked off by this insulator. And with that, we can actually determine um, things like whether or not how big the cell is, how soft it is, how stiff it is, just by looking to see how long it takes to pass through. A softer cell will pass through that narrow segment faster than a stiffer cell. And we can also look to see how well a cell will recover from being squeezed all in one, you know, in one shot, which is really cool. And so with us, what we did is we teamed with Mark Labarge's group. And um, essentially, we learned from him that there are two types of epithelial cells in the mammary duct. There's the myoepithelial cells. They're responsible for ductal contraction, and they're largely resistant to being um, cancerous. And then you have something called the luminal epithelial cells that line the mammary cells. And the luminal epithelial cells are the ones that produce milk. And they're the ones that are soft and they generally become cancerous cells. And in fact, they're known as the cells of cancer origin for women who are old. And so what we were able to do was to take um, cells from Mark's um, uh, biobank 
of different women of different ages. And what we were able to do is measure them through our device. Um, and the gray is our data, but we're able to tell the difference between the two different cell types just based upon their stiffness. And in addition, what's really cool, and it's still always mind blowing to me, is the fact that we're doing a mechanical measurement and we can look and see two different cell types and, their, and determine their ratios. Um, Mark does this through traditional biological assays by labeling these cells with um, fluorophores and he gets exactly the same ratio as us. So, you know, here we're looking at biochemical measurement, here we're looking at mechanical measurement and we meet in the center, we get the same data. So that was really amazing. Um, now, what we've also found is the fact that um, if you take w young women, so this was um, a young woman, 19 years old, and this was an older woman at 61 years old. If you take, a, for instance, a 19-year-old woman who has one of these BRCA mutations, what we find is actually the cells from that woman with the mutation behave mechanically as though they were from an older woman from a woman who's in her 60s. So mechanically, this young woman with this mutation is essentially that has the same age as a 60 plus year old woman. And um, definitely very different from a woman who is at the same age, but doesn't have the mutation. So that was really amazing. And what we've done is we've built a, a machine learning algorithm that essentially we call it our age um, algorithm. So we can now just take cells from his biobank from different women, plug it into our, um, um, get our data from the device, plug in the data into our uh, machine learning algorithm, and we essentially get a mechanical age and from that woman. And so what we now have this whole idea that, you know, as I mentioned, 80% of women who have a mutation will develop breast cancer, but we don't know who. Well, it may be a, a, this device that we've developed and our algorithm, um, it may be the case where there's just how far apart this mechanical age is versus the chronological age of a woman is really going to determine that risk factor. So the, the older themselves look like mechanically means that the woman has a higher, presumably, might have a higher chance of developing breast cancer versus another woman where that age gap is 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 closer together. And this is something that Mark and I are pursuing, and it's it's quite exciting. So that's um sort of an example of things that we're doing in my lab. But what I thought I would do and sort of end is just tell you about something that I've done that's completely different. Um, and I. And I think this really speaks a lot to things, for instance, what's happening, at, what has happened at Stanford um, as president over the summertime where he had to step down because of, um, because of figures that were not quite um, reproducible or duplicated um, in his, in different papers of his. So, Essentially, I became involved in something that we all now call the Henrik Schoen Affair. And I'd like to emphasize to everyone that I don't have the umlaut in my name, so unrelated. <laughs> but essentially, who was Henrik Schoen? Um, this is a picture of Henrik. Um, he was very famous for, in the early 2000s, um, that he was writing 100 papers in a few years. So it essentially came down in 2001, he was publishing a nature science paper, one paper every eight days. So for the graduate students in the audience, you would know that that's like really almost, that's impossible. Um, and what he claimed was that he had all these different breakthroughs and all of this, he was the first author. He had about 13, 15 different co-authors, but he was always the first author. At the time, Bell Laboratories, and if you remember, this is where I did my postdoc in the 90s, Bell, Laboratory, Bell Laboratories, um, it was owned by Lucent at the time, and then it, um, Aguirre, there was a thought that Aguirre was going to buy it up, I believe. And so everyone was worried what would happen to Bell Labs um, because it was a research um, arm of the company. And so this really gave this whole idea that Henrik Schoen was 
getting these fancy papers out. He was claiming to have a single molecule laser. He was claiming to have a single molecule transistor and various other devices. This seemed like this was like an amazing um, opportunity for Bell Labs because they were showing he was showing you could do things beyond silicon, which was, you know, which was the state of the art at the time. The awards that he got, everything ran from the Brunschweig Prize in Germany to Outstanding Material Research Society investigator. There were thought there was definitely he was being nominated for the Nobel Prize. He was being known as he was being offered a directorship at the Max Planck, and he would have been the youngest person there. I think he was 27 or 28 at the time. Um, there were warning signs um, of weird things because he was incredibly product productive, um, kept on getting these amazing results. He, for the engineers, electrical engineers in the audience, he was, for his FETs, he was achieving um, voltage breakdown of the aluminum oxide that he was using in his FETs. Um, and I think the most important thing is that no one could reproduce any of his results. And so lots of different, um, different labs around the world were working on it. And there was certainly a lot of money being poured into this. People were concerned. And so internally, people were also concerned. And so the company itself had an investigation early on, but they gave him an opportunity to reply to various things and they were satisfied. So that was the end of the investigation that Bell had at the time. So as I mentioned, I was a postdoc at a certain point at Bell Labs. And so I got a mysterious phone call and a voicemail that told me, and this was May 2000, April 2002, um, I got a phone call, a voicemail from someone who didn't identify himself and just said that you should look at these couple of papers of Henrik. So, of course, the person that I am, I decided to do that. And this is one of the papers. And essentially what you can see is this is his um, single, I think this is his thin film, um, FET, that he was measuring. And this is his voltage um, current curve. Um, yeah. And so this is what it looks like, nothing out of the normal. Um, and then this was in nature. And then you didn't, you, you did blink, but it's essentially here is a science paper came out like a few weeks later. And this was a SAMFET. It was at a different temperature. But what you can see is, is that everything looks very similar um, to the previous um, slide that I just showed you from a different paper. And in fact, I think I overlaid the two of them. Yeah, so I just overlaid both of them together and you can see they're identical to one another. And you can see here, what I've labeled here are the red, in red, that's the noise and the noise reproduces itself, even though it was taken at different temperatures. Then he had another, oh yeah, so this was on top of, so this, sorry, this was on top, the two um, data figures on top of one another from two different papers. And then here's another one where he was looking at a crystal FET. Um, this was done a year earlier, and you can see that it's exactly the same figure um, and exact same data, the same um, noise. But you can see now that um, the X and Y axis are just different. Mm -hmm. you know? So it was quite remarkable. You didn't need to know any of the signs. You just had to have a good eye. And at that point, it was like, wow. Um, and so a person who in the, was in the physics department at Berkeley, a good friend of mine, Paul McEwen, I told him, and then we decided, well, if this is just one case, there has to be more. And so this was something that we found after staying up all night. This is another device that he made. Note that this is an N-channel device, current versus drain. And you can see the data. This was in science. This is an applied physics letters. This, this is for perylene, it's a P-channel, okay? So the, ne the negative signs correspond to a P-channel, but it's exactly the same data. So here it is, two of them on top of one another. And then we found another um, slide, another fit. This was, okay, so that's perylene on top. And then here's pentacene. It's exactly the same figure um, in three different, in three different um, journals. 
And so this was quite remarkable for us that we were like, wow, again, you didn't have to know any of his work. You didn't have to know the signs. You just had to look to see if the figures um, were, I, were the same. Um, so I think this is a great example of the ethics that and that Paul and I followed once we realized and we found a few other um, journals of different data, we did we put everything together into a PowerPoint and we decided that we were going to go to the journals. We went to one journal with the very first data and we asked um, the nature to ask Henrik Schoen to explain how these the data were all the same. They said they would look into it. Um, and then in the meantime, we found all this other data. And so what we ended up doing was we decided that the right thing to do was to first notify Bell Laboratories um, before going public with what we found. And so it took us a long time to get in touch with someone at Bell Labs. Everyone was at a conference, um, but we found someone um, and he took it all in, but he said, he asked us to give them one hour to get everything in place um, and to, you know, have the whole um, Bell Labs notified and, you know, for us to just wait one hour and then we could do whatever we wanted. So we did, we gave them an hour. And then we also, Paul was, ended up calling up Henrik Schoen and telling him, this is, we're going to, we're going to let everyone know what happened. His response was, he didn't know what, how, how this happened. And then um, Paul and I went public with it. We went to the different journals um, and it was interesting to hear the response. Some of them wanted us to help them figure out what to do and others told us to get a lawyer because that's what they were going to do. So it was kind of a crazy time. I would say that um, my very first graduate student was inadvertently involved in this because he had to answer all the different um, reporters that were calling, um, calling me for six months, this went on for six months. So we, he and I lost six months of research at the time and lots of people were mad. A lot of people had invested time in, in trying to reproduce Henrik Schoen's data and weren't willing to, to accept it at the time. Um, I've had people call me and say that they, that I would never work any in the field again. <laughs> And I was like, okay, fine, because most of my grad school friends at the time had gone off to Wall Street and working on derivatives. So I knew I could get a job that way. So, but I thought this was something that I could contribute to the science field. Um, so what happened was that Bell Labs created a, um, a committee um, similar to what happened to the Stanford um, president. Um, and you can see the various people who were in this blue ribbon committee. Um, they opened it up to everyone to submit any papers. We submitted five. Eventually, there were 25 papers, and then they just stopped because it was too much. Um, and then it took a few months for the committee to release their report. Um, they didn't. Um, this is just a list of all the allegations, and essentially, you could see that there's a lot of data substitution, unrealistic precisions conflicting with no, you know, with the known laws of physics and so forth. Um, I think what's interesting is that they gave him an opportunity to reproduce the data um, and to show the meta metadata. He said he had erased everything in his hard disk drive because he he ran out of date out of room on his hard disk, which is <laughs> amazing because it is a, you know, a tech company. They sent him off to Germany because that's where he claimed he was um, that's where he claimed he was making his devices. So they gave him a ticket to go. And when he came back, he said that his devices got destroyed in his suitcase. So, right. Um, in the end, he ended up, they, I think they said that there were um, 16 papers. or I think in the end, all of the papers were retracted um, from the different journals. There are questions about co-authors because remember, he had about 13 to 15 co-authors. Um, there were comments. I think the, the main thing really to know is that there was, it was decided there was a special role for intellectual leaders. So that's where the Stanford professor also comes into play because he was the leader of his team, just like um, Henrik had a leader, Bertram Batlog. Um, 
I think what is interesting is sort of an outcome of all of this is that there's now very stringent rules. So when you submit a paper, you have to explain who has done what. So that's all because of this. Um, this is an ethics module in some law schools and medical schools. So it kind of lives on um, beyond what we had done, Paul and I had done. And there's a couple of books. This one, Plastic Fantastic, is about what Paul and I had um, uncovered. And then um, this was something that we were reading at the time when we were looking up um, Henrik Schoen, going through the Henrik Schoen stuff. What we can, I can say is that the people who copy their data there's a very similar personality. It always happens in a very similar way. Mm -hmm. um, my days of this are all over. So if you know of any other things, I don't want to know about it. <laughs> like I said, I lost a lot of time and everything like that, but I felt that it was the right thing to do. Oh, so, yeah, so that just gives you just a flavor and I'm happy to answer questions, but this is really my, my, this is my life. It's, in some ways, it's very simple. In other ways, it got very complicated. Um, and I just want to part with this for all of you who are going through um, graduate school. Um, this was the very first thing that was told to the Harvard undergraduates um, when we were freshmen in our, in, in our convocation, which was from the pre president of Radcliffe that life is like mayonnaise, keep cool, but do not freeze. And I <laughs> really believe that that is a very, very, very true statement. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'll just take questions. And again, thank you for um, just the time to talk about this. That was wonderful. Yeah. One question. Um, yeah. How did that transition from physics to bioengineering happen? Yeah, okay, that's a great question. So I would say that I have always been interested in, you know, because I did start off with chemistry and I was kind of a pre-med at the beginning as an undergraduate. Um, I'll say that when I was at Princeton, it wasn't exactly a friendly environment. And so I had many friends in biology and essentially they were like, well, if you're not gonna get tenure, just, you know, why don't you just learn something new? And I thought, well, I might as well go up in flames and enjoy what I want to do. And so I started to um, go to people's group meetings in biology at Princeton and build very uh, strong friendships there. Um, it was like learning a new language. I was told that I shouldn't dabble in it. I should just jump in. So that's what I did. Um, career suicide in many ways. But I really had a great time it's still, it's like learning a new language um, and then putting your own take on things. And um, I'm pretty much very happy with, with my decision though in the end. Um, I find that the questions are just really rich in terms of, you know, in terms of trying to solve something where you're never really gonna solve because there's too many parameters in biology and everything. But um, yeah, and I also learned that even if you don't understand a talk, you definitely, there's universally, you can always have a feel if a talk is gonna is good or not. Mm -hmm. It just somehow, even though you don't understand it, you know when a talk is good or not. So it took a while, but that's how I ended up in bioengineering. What, was it uh, uh, difficult for you to go to Berkeley and you didn't want to go straight into bioengineering, but go to mechanical engineering? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I will say, so, you know, I was I was asked to apply to mechanical engineering um, by someone in the department, and I said, "Well, I'm not a mechanical engineer. I've never taken I've never taken any engineering courses, but one." And the person said, "Well, we're looking for the non traditional, unconventional mechanical engineer." I'm like, "That's me." <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I will say that my department, you know, pretty much everyone just it's everyone gets to do what they want to do. And I think also it speaks a lot about the whole Berkeley culture that we have, every professor has a home department, but you can do different things with other people, right? There's no, there are no walls. There's no fiefdoms, right? Um, I, there's some new professors in my department right now. And I've told them, you know, for the first six months I was here at Berkeley, I never had to buy lunch. Someone was always taking me out to lunch <laughs> to get to know me, to see what the commonality was and everything like that. And I truly have always appreciated that tremendously. Oh, and so I think that it really speaks about the Berkeley culture overall, the level of openness. 
to try crazy ideas. So, yeah, yeah. I uh, posted the uh, the name of the movie on the chat. Oh yes, yes. I saw that movie on YouTube. You did. I, when you mentioned, <laughs> I think I remember uh, seeing that too. I, yeah. already, I kind of knew that already. Yeah. I think it's so cool. I mean, there's really something like didn't truly appreciate it. You know, my parents would tell me this, and of course, my cousins, all of us knew about it. But when I made um, one of my first trips to Korea, we went to the National Museum. This is like there. And then <laughs> a couple of other scholars that my parent, my mom, on my mom's side, that my dad was showing us. I'm like, wow, I didn't know that. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Who knew? That's all I have to say. So I enjoy it. So. Well, unfortunately, the, the story that you tell about the uh, academic fraud is still going on. There's still people finding things. And then also with some of this uh, open access yeah. journals and things like that is still happening. Mm -hmm. I got you know, letters from quote unquote editors saying that if you do this, we don't want to charge you. Or if you want to publish faster, two weeks, it will charge yeah. you more. Pay, mm -hmm. pay for play. Yeah. So there's still a lot of that going on. And there are, you know, in some countries, you know, to advance, that's what they do. You know, yeah. I met some professors who are 35 and years old and have, you know, like close to 200 publications. Yeah. Many of them are actually from the students. They put their name on top, right? In front. Yeah. People will uh, just put people's names on it. Yeah, people name and, and it's mandatory that the professor's name got into the co author list, mm -hmm. whether they do anything or not. So, so I, I don't, going, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt. But I think that um I have the New York Times um had done a study around that time with the Henrik Schoen thing. Which was, and by the way, that's when I made my mom proud because I was being interviewed in the New York Times. So she was very happy that she could see my name. She still does not know what I do, but she was very happy to see my name in the in the Times. Um, but the thing that I thought was interesting was there, you know, the amount of fraud, scientific fraud that has been reported. It goes like this, and it suddenly jumps up, like, and that corresponds to also when Photoshop was released to the public. So oh, I thought that was very interesting. Very it actually interesting, yeah. it, it tracks completely. Mm -hmm. And then uh, most recently, I was asked for my opinion again by the Times um, about there's a case in Rochester where the um, the person claimed the PI claimed to have room temperature superconductivity, mm -hmm. and then it turns out everything was fake. And Sounds stuff. like Utah. Yeah. Remember the yeah. case of the Utah? You remember yeah. Utah? That was the mm -hmm. room temperature superconductor. Yep, it's the same team and everything. And same that team. one's remarkable because they all were turning on to each other. You know, they everyone. And it's just like crazy. And I felt also really terrible for the graduate students because you know, I don't you know, who knows what really happened, but they were all blaming each other and just throwing everyone under the bus. And it was just like, wow. <laughs> You know, and I just felt that that was just really very sad. Thank yeah, you. we have quite a few explorers that are really like into, you know, get into the academic uh, mm -hmm. career. I know it's a very tough one. Most people know it is. What kind of advice would you give them? You know, uh, first, for instance, getting experience in industry help. I know you have to go for fellowship and such. Yeah, I think. Well, okay, so I, I, you know, for me, it wasn't really my dad who encouraged me to go into academia. Um, it was really um, Harvard Physics Department at the time was very much, you are going to go into academia or you're no one. <laughs> to me, quite honestly, right? That was, that was what they were training us all to be. So I didn't know that there were options. But now that, you know, I've been in academia for a very long time, I would say that now I feel like that this was and still is the perfect job for me. I enjoy the freedom. I enjoy just discovering and choosing my problems. Um, it's not easy at all. 
it is on the job training. And this was <laughs> confirmed by my own advisor when I was seeking advice from him when I started my job lab. And he's like, on the job training, you know, if the road bends, you better bend with it, you know, or else you're going to fall off the cliff. <laughs> so, you know, I think having some industry experience helps. It get, puts everything into perspective, honestly, you know, because in grad school, you only have that one perspective of academia, but it's good to have another aspect, which is, which is industry and sort of seeing, you know, is this something that you would be interested in or not? I think that when you are starting out and even now when you're in grads, when you're starting your own lab, it is a lot like having a startup because you have to be the one, you have to be the manager, you have to be the one to raise the funds, you have to, you know, you have to get people working, blah, 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 blah. And it's multitasking at its best. And there are definitely days where it's just like, it's time to just go home. <laughs> it's, just, it's just too hard and too depressing and everything like that. But, you know, um, there are days when something really cool happens. The student comes and shows me this amazing data and it's just exciting and everything like that. So, yeah, but I think academia, you know, it used to be if you really did set on that, should also do a postdoc because the postdoc will allow you to have a few years where you can pursue research that you want to do or are interested in, build your name, your reputation, and money comes from somewhere else. So you don't even have to worry about that, right? Mm -hmm. um, in engineering, people typically will actually skip that postdoc and just go into academia. And I think that's kind of, I don't know, it's a different, a different culture for me to even understand that. Because I think like, because once you become a professor day one, you really stop being a student. You stop really doing research for yourself. It's all been transferred over to your graduate students. And I think that's also what my advisor told me too, was, you know, it's not, it's no longer about me. It's about the graduate students. So, you know, are you going to get them a job? <laughs> you have to live with that, you know, so. Yeah. Are you going to get money to support them through the program? That's the big yeah. one, yeah. I've made sacrifices where I did not have enough money to cover payroll. So I've, I've gave up my um, own summer salary. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I've, I've taken hits myself and I, now that I have twins and they're almost, you know, almost college years, I promised my husband, I would never do that again. So I've <laughs> three times that, and it's I promise I would never do that again. <laughs> but, you know, it for me, it was the research was important mentoring the students was important so i'm 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 willing to make that sacrifice i'm not sure every professor does that but you know i'm willing to do that to to ensure success yeah can, can i ask a quick question mm -hmm. yeah so so uh i think as mentioned before i so i am a physics phd student i work on maybe some of like the theoretical aspects of superconductivity so it's quite mm -hmm. interesting to hear that you, you know, you did your postdoc and, you know, on these nanofabrications. So did you enter Princeton with the intention of continuing with similar research and then found the environment quite unfriendly? And, and I've heard even to this day, maybe it's not so bad as it was then, but I've still heard it's not the... Yes, uh, yes, I mean, that, yeah. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite interesting to, to see that. I mean, yeah, I'm just interested in hearing more about uh, this. So, you know, you know, it's very true. Um, you know, I had my dilution fridge. I set it up. Princeton and I'm telling you I knew nothing about anything like when we had to dig a hole into the basement level you know to put the dilution fridge people ask me about rebar and I'm like what is rebar you know that's kind of like how um how ignorant how you know I was I was spoiled by being in this very old traditional laboratory and everything like that um but yeah I think it, it's i ended up just changing because I wasn't getting the support, I wasn't getting the students because Princeton was pretty much at that point, all string theory. And I didn't win any friends by asking a string theorist, first of all, what K theory was and how that was different from <laughs> M theory. And also with string theory, can you in the end make it come down to F equals MA? I didn't win any friends that way. <laughs> Right. But, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I enjoy still listening about, you know, all the quantum um, 
computational stuff that's being done here on campus and elsewhere. One of my very best friends, Leo Pauenhoven, you know, I learned a lot of stuff from him and other things. And so, you know, it's a whole group of, of friends that I still have and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've got a quick question too, if you don't mind. First, like fascinating talk. I, I was very like on the edge of my seat for the, the last part of the scandal. Um, I am curious, did you ever find out who called you and tipped you about the papers or? Yes, I, I know who it was. Okay. Yeah. 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 So. And then my second, oh, I don't know if you want to share, so no, no worries about that. Um, but my second question was, what are your like thoughts about who should get um, kind of that blame or how like the co-authors of different papers should be attributed to some of that? Like, were they able to identify that it was all his doing or? Yeah, um, you know, so that's always like the whole ethical debate that people will always have, right? And I think that, um, you know, I'm quite infamous, famous. So this is also when I learned how to talk to reporters because someone did call me up a reporter from whatever journal or whatever magazine and they you know they said well how much do you think this guy Bertram Batlog who was his supervisor is responsible because he was also the, like the last author thing and I just quickly said well in you know in the real world when someone is a student driver you have to drive with someone who has a license and if you get into an accident who's the one who's responsible it's the one who has a license Okay, that was also, you know, that got in print and it's just like, oh, when I saw it, I just, I can't really have to be careful what I say. But, you know, right, it's kind of true. So I think, you know, being a lost author, you know, I am the last author on my papers, right? And there's a lot of like, you know, you worry, but at the same time, you, 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 you trust, you have to have trust with your team, right? That's, or else nothing's never, nothing's going to happen. And so, you know, I think, as part of my job as a professor is to play that devil's advocate, you know, say like, you know, have you done everything and blah, blah, blah. I think there was only one time that I asked a student to show me, you know, his results and his data. And it was because it was the stuff where it was the, the mechanical phenotyping data looked exactly like the same biochemical. And I couldn't believe it. It was just mm. like, no, you're making this up. Right. Even though <laughs> he didn't know what the ratio number was that, Mark Labarge was getting. So I was like, show me. So I sat with him and he was so disgusted, but he showed me, I'm like, oh, okay, that's pretty cool, right? But I mean, and he knew I was just like, this is unbelievable mostly. But I think, you know, it's trust, but then if someone points something out, you have to pursue it as, as your PI, as the PI, just like, you know, Mark Tessier was told, you know, maybe you should check these things. And I'm not sure, you know, I don't know really what happened or anything like that, but it's of a similar vein, everything. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, I hope they make a movie out of your case. I, I feel like this would <laughs> be fascinating. <laughs> I, it is a BBC documentary oh. and on it for a while, it was on the Discover Channel, then on Netflix, because someone wrote to me go, I saw you on a Netflix thing. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't want to know about it. I know what it is. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll have to dig that up. No, don't. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> it's kind of mortifying, you know, it's just something like, I don't like to look at myself, give a talk. It's of the similar vein. And I think Paul McKinnon also felt that same way, like, oh my God. <laughs> So yeah, I, I think we when we see ourselves on video or think recording, basically, say, did I sound like that? I <laughs> How come I sound like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was an interesting time, and I feel like you know, again, I feel like I did I did a service to the community, and um, you know, pass it on. You know, <laughs> on occasion, people have asked me things. I'm like, no, I'm the one yeah. again. As I said earlier, it's sad to see that things are still like this are still going on. I think the latest yeah. case is the head of the medical department in Colombia. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The whole set, the whole set of papers 
and all his students are all involved in like, faking data. It, it's uh, just, uh, as he just said, a... you know, uh, 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 using the graphic thing to turn the uh, the figure around. Mm. Right? Oh to, yeah. yeah, yeah, mirror image the things. Yeah, yeah. So it was it, it. You know, I think for me. You know, there's three years of people trying to reproduce Henrik Schoen's data. There was millions of dollars being poured in, right? And then, and it's just so like if you were trying, I don't understand it from from an outsider point of view because by that time I'd moved on to a different field, but I didn't understand if you were trying to reproduce someone's data, why aren't you looking at the papers, right? You should have seen it because that's all we had to do was to see it and everything like that. Yeah. And then really after the fact that the, after this blue panel committee came out with its, you know, published report, people just said, oh, we knew it and just went on. And I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like, how did that happen? It's just crazy. But yeah, let's. So, you know, Paul McEwen and I always like we, you know, Paul at that point was at Cornell. I was in um, Princeton. And then Henrik Schoen was in Murray Hill, New Jersey. So we all were within dry, driving distance. So mm -hmm. we were all kind of like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> how do you know he's not going to get into a car, you know? And we're like, oh my, you know, there was, <laughs> we're very nervous. We were very yeah. That was brave. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so, yeah. We, we uh, I think, uh, we, it's really, you know, it's really warm to for, for Lindia to tell us so much about her personal life and her journey. I mean, it's it's rare to get hear that sometimes. So I like <laughs> to thank her for doing that. Um, well, no, thank yeah. you. Appreciate the right. opportunity. Yeah. So, yeah, and I really appreciate everything that you do for the graduate students. I think you really build a really really strong, nice community for everyone. Yeah.